you're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. And we are here discussing the last of the three interactive mystery fiction stories that we will be covering this year on Death of the Reader. And this week, it is Rooster Teeth's Dead Little Roosters. This is the third in a series of whodunit interactive games put together by Josh Flanagan. And this one was co-directed by Fiona Nova. We are going to be talking about episodes one to six today. Basically, this is a, uh, a fantastic case study in putting something like this up against an audience. It is a trope of crime fiction uh, gatherings, be it festivals or dinner parties, to have a live interactive murder mystery game of some sort. And basically, Dead Little Roosters is the the pinnacle of that in some sure. ways. Yeah, I mean, look, it's a, it's a pretty like standard setup for a story like this. You've got 10 people and the the rich man's been killed. But uh, the, the game does guarantee, and this might be my favorite part of the way this show is kind of presented. Uh, in the very first episode, after you've kind of watched the first kill, the first of the 10 being killed, the, uh, the showrunners actually take the audience aside and say, here is a list of all the characters. Here is a list of all the weapons. The murderer is amongst the 10 guests and we're going to ask you guys to try and solve based on this like rhyme we put together who is the killer and how do the people die and all that sort of stuff yeah so this took place in january and february of this year and i wanted to start today by actually going through the dead little roosters addendum which was sure. the uh you know uh 10 little indians equivalent uh, that we had here. Kill Soldiers, that one, yeah. Uh, because each of the iterations of this has in some way had that poem uh, in a very, and then there were none, inspired cadence. So let us begin. Mm -hmm. Locks of gold and quick to quip. The first was touched by toxic tip. Revolving death at dire strait. The second slain one of its eight. Pinnacle of things that were. The third met thorn symbolic spur. Taste of trouble weapon flown. The fourth filleted reaped what was sown. Bold of will but muddled mind. The fifth was felled by double bind. Prey of lies and lifted prose. The sixth spiraled into their woes. Healess cooped in trepidation. The seventh succumbed to hand of creation. Rivalry of siblings past. The eighth ended as first forecast. For the ninth, the killer, justice was fated, so the tenth survived and celebrated. There you go. And that is the, the poem, the addendum, apparently. They call it addendum <laughs> now. Poem is too good for us, uh, or not good enough for us, rather. Uh, but basically, this is supposed to foreshadow from the very first episode all the different characters on the show and how they're going to die. And uh, they they tell us, and it's it's pretty obvious from the get-go, that a lot of these, uh, these descriptions of deaths are references to the the cast and characters on the show and also other shows that Rooster Teeth has kind of put together. For those of you who aren't familiar with Rooster Teeth, it is a internet media empire that started with a little series called Red vs. Blue based in the game Halo. And essentially the Little Roosters series that they've been doing, these whodunits, is... I don't want to call them an advertising campaign because I feel like that's... <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> it's, it's not quite so cynical as that, yeah. but they do very cleverly and a little bit sneakily function as that because in order to participate in the contest that was going on as this show was released, you, had, you were kind of encouraged to go and you know watch these shows. I know, for instance, that my years and years of watching the hits uh, animated series Ruby have paid <laughs> off with at least two of these deaths. And essentially, because Rooster Teeth is a uh, video creation company that prides itself on having a community dedicated to it, uh, much in the same way that if Marvel was to, for example, interact more directly with their fans sure. in response to their movies, Rooster Teeth treats this as a series of a lot of fan service to in not only encourage fans to uh, go check out the other stuff, but also reward them for having already checked it out because presumably they already have as fans of the company. And it's not it's not without precedent. Like a lot of the humor of the company of Little Roosters in all their shows is very self-referential, uh, very kind of metatextual in a sense. Um, and yeah, a, a lot of these uh, a lot of these solutions that we're going to talk about today, a lot of the events. Uh, definitely tie back into the company culture as well. And one of the things that's fun about this is that Dead Little Roosters is actually the third iteration of this series. It started with 10 Little Roosters, uh, which was quintessentially clunky for that era of <laughs> Rooster Teeth in a way that was very charming if you were a fan at the time, but could be really rough to go back and watch. Now, 11 Little Roosters was a little bit more experimental, and I wasn't a huge fan of it, but I think it still kind of captured the spirit of getting the community involved and putting in their solutions to the series really well. Well, the series has always been 
been very experimental. You know, the entire premise of doing a murder mystery with effectively just people around the office is uh, is a bit touch and go to begin with. Whereas this one here, I feel like they have absolutely found their footing. Well, the production quality is through the roof. And we have to clarify, this show was uh, produced, you know, during uh, during COVID restrictions and, and with the health of the company members in mind. So the way that the story is actually set up is not just that there are 10 people in a mansion, it's that there are 10 people each locked in their own rooms uh, with the couple, uh, Lindsay and Michael Jones, obviously being in the same room together. Um, but more or less, these characters, when they interact with each other, they're doing it from entirely different locations and they use camera tricks and narrative tricks to kind of get them to interact and put them in the same room when they need to be. Yeah, it's really fun. For example, uh, Ife Nawadawe, one of the cast members, who I believe is based in an entirely different state to the rest of the cast, is killed by someone in a complete... Uh, you know, full body covering suit. And I think that whilst it plays into the story in terms of not knowing the killer's identity, that was probably spawned out of uh, not actually being able to have Iffy in the same location as the rest of the cast. I think the other thing that was really good about this series compared to my experience with the previous ones was just how how much more on the ball the entire cast was in terms of their improvisation actually leaning into the story. Because as far as I understand, a lot of the scenes and humor that we see are uh, improvised by the cast around the general framework of the script uh, because the strictures and murder mystery stuff where the audience actually has to solve it is largely to do with background pieces and the core structure of the poem. There's a very bold kind of decision here. Uh, the characters in the show are named as themselves. Yeah. There's Barbara and, and Michael and Lindsay. And if you like, everybody there is named as themselves, but they're all dressed up in makeup and costumes. Um, even to the point that when uh, Michael's character passes away, spoilers, uh, they, they give him this really like grotesque, like death makeup to like indicate that he's deceased. He's all gray and stuff, but because he's still available for, for shooting with, with his wife on the show, he can still be part of the the, the story and part of the experience which is really fantastic and it's really great because then you have all of these moments of Lindsay basically using Michael's as corpse a as a puppet it's and great yeah. it's, it's so completely far-fetched and ridiculous but because of the way it fits in with the humor of the show in this very kind of pseudo improvised uh, but nonetheless structured setup there's so much fun stuff that comes of it that wouldn't have any place in any other story but uh, Josh and Fiona, the creators of this show and the rest of the team behind it have done a marvelous job of taking things that are completely ridiculous and embedding them in a show where it feels at home. And ultimately, uh, and we'll you know have to see how this plays out with the tail end of the show because obviously sure. we're going to have to have some character resolutions here. This is not a mystery story that I think will satisfy you. In the clinical nature of it, no. Yeah, no it I will you're not, <laughs> for example, scratch the same itch as a murder mystery fiction book. But I think it is an excellent example of why I think murder mystery is having a bit of a social resurgence at the moment in that sure. people feel a bit more free to make these weird decisions, weird series, and have a bit more fun with the tropes and ideas of the genre rather than being locked down in the golden age tropes we love so much. I mean, it has a feeling a lot closer to one of those dinner parties, murder mystery dinner parties, than it does anything written by by Christie or, or Knox or so forth, right? Yeah, I think if you're the kind of person who's gone to festivals and participated in those events- It kind of uh, campy feel. Yeah, yeah. This, this will be very homely for you. And I think is a great way, even if you, for example, run a festival or participate uh, in organizing festivals in some way, of actually getting ideas on how to run stuff and loosen things up a little uh, because the blend of that self-referential humor without it being too self-referential in and having fun with it and still creating a genuine game with it, it's really impressive. I feel like the balance is just right. Uh, it's not too hot, not too cold. And the whole thing is brought together, especially by the set design and the costumes and the acting and the direction. It's all beautiful. And at the same time, very minimal. It's not like overbearing. You don't feel like you're staring down a just field of visual noise and information. They also, I, I just want to say before we wrap things out, I think they actually handle the 10 cast members quite well as well. You never feel like someone's being left out. No, absolutely. Unless they're probably the killer. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think we should get into that a bit more next week when we can we look at how will. it started to get affected as people were knocked off the cast as oh, well. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, but either way, we are talking about Dead Little Roosters, Rooster Teeth's 2021 whodunit interactive adventure game. Murder mystery. And uh, we will be back with more of that in just a second. Yeah. 
you're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here. We are talking Rooster Teeth's Dead Little Roosters today. We're incredibly pleased to be joined by John Ingold, a founder and narrative director at Inkle, a British video game company that specializes in replayable narrative games. We've brought John to discuss their recently released title, Overboard, a murder mystery game set on a boat where you are the murderer. John, it's so great to have you here. Welcome to Death of the Reader. Hi, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. So, John, your game seems to tackle the age-old question, can reading murder mysteries help you get away with murder? As I mentioned, we're talking Dead Little Roosters today, which is, as a piece of interactive fiction, is very defined in what it asks of its players. You know from the very beginning what sort of inputs you need to make to win the game, whereas in Overboard, it's very much the opposite. It's open-ended in terms of what actions you need to take for various outcomes. How much trust do you have to put into your players to leave them so, pun intended, at sea? So there's a whole load of design that goes behind that to make that work. Because if you make a if you make a game that's totally open, then people tend to wander around prodding things. They don't know quite what to do, and you lose that momentum. Because the goal, if you do your job right as a narrative designer, what you do is you make a world where the player feels like everything they do matters, whether it's a little thing, like you know the way that you talk to someone, or whether it's a big thing, like coshing someone over the back of the head with a small statuette while they're not looking. Uh, which is kind of like if you're writing a a, a normal murder mystery or a normal thriller or something, it probably ought to feel like that too. There's always something at stake. Uh, it's just in our game, what's at stake is the future life of the protagonist of the of the game. Which is arguably a, a smaller stake than, you know, a, you know, a lot of video games, you're saving the world, running around, shooting people. But in this, it's it's one person's life or, or maybe two, depending on, I guess, how you kind of play the game. Um, now, I, I guess I would ask, uh, during our playthrough, we actually uh, observed what I think was kind of a kind of a catch-all moment. The first time we reached an ending, there was or a bunch of different characters who weren't on screen kind of shouted, you know, at once that we'd messed up. You know, what time we'd we'd killed the the or that the murder victim had gone missing. How kind of pervasive is that idea of the catch-all mechanic? That you know, there are lots of specific moments that stand out, but sometimes. Uh, the player can can fail one way, but in a lot of different ways. You have to kind of catch them in one in one net, if that makes sense. The Overboard is structured like a classic 1930s Agatha Christie mystery, right? In that you, you the murder happens at the beginning or, or near, you know, very near the beginning. And then there's a bunch of stuff that goes on. And then at the end, the detective character gathers everyone into a room and says, right, let's let's just talk this through. You know, it's that classic end of Poirot scene. Of course, the twist is that you're not Poirot. You're the person you're really hoping Poirot isn't going to point the finger at. So although there are a couple of other ways to end a game of Overboard early, mostly by jumping off the boat yourself, I really wanted to capture that sense of the classic 30s structure. So it always ends in this scene in the restaurant where the characters will come together and talk about what they found and lay the blame on someone. Because the fun of it is, is to see how much you can poke and prod and get it to twist and bend. And then, of course, the detective character, the fun of him is him trying to pull the plot back onto track and say, no, 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 wait, no, 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 no. We are supposed to be accusing you. So it's a battle of wills between you, the protagonist, and this this character who is your nemesis. Uh, one really interesting decision that I, that I did like was that the first few times he succeeded in getting away with the crime, uh, a new twist uh, can be introduced and you have to reconsider your objectives, uh, get a new piece of backstory and start again. Uh, what did withholding goals from the player uh, from the beginning of the game allow you to do that you couldn't have otherwise? It's rule of three, isn't it? There are three core game objectives, right? The first objective is just to get away with it. The second objective is a bit of a twist on that. And then the third objective is a twist on the twist of that. So what that lets us do is essentially to build a three act structure into a game that you don't that doesn't have three acts to it. So the first time you play the game, you, you open it up, this murder happens, and it's just one thing, get away with it. You've just got to get away with it. And hopefully the player is running around the ship like a mad jackrabbit with everything just going wrong. Everything they touch goes wrong. Everyone they talk to goes, wait a minute, didn't you say this earlier? And you go, oh no, I did. And like, and it's a disaster. The first playthrough should be an utter disaster. And by the end of the game, you should be just the guiltiest person in the room because that's the most fun, right? Finally, you go back, you get that objective right. And you think, yes, I've done it. And along comes this second objective that says, no, you didn't. <laughs> and you can go back. Because I think one of the things we have to be really careful of is not overwhelming the player at any point. If you look at Christie stuff, I read a couple of Christie novels in preparation for writing this. And one thing she tries really carefully to do, but she doesn't always get right, is, is to make sure there's enough characters that you're interested and you've got different people to suspect, 
but not many, so many characters that you can't keep track of who the hell is who. So again, one of the things we can do because of the interactive thing is we can layer that information in at a pace that the player can handle and actually turn the interactivity into a way of distributing information at a good speed. Yeah, I guess talking about providing iterative information, each time, as Herds mentioned, you get a new ending, you also get an extra piece of backstory. You get a newspaper clipping talking about what was going on, the setup, the lead into the crime. For example, we discover that Malcolm, who was the protagonist's husband, had some really nasty political leanings. What led to the decision to make the murder victim someone uh, dislikable, but simultaneously, as the game goes on, start to chip away at the, I guess, levels of morality on the ship? You know, slowly we start to see that the rest of the cast isn't as spotless as uh, you might have originally thought. So when I started the project, there was this the protagonist, this woman, Veronica Villanzi, she's an actress and she pushes her husband overboard in the first 10 seconds of the game. And then it's like, right, what are you going to do about it? And someone said, it was about three, four weeks into writing. They said, "How? I'm a bit worried. How are we going to get the player to sympathize with this woman? And I said, well, I, I don't understand the question. She's the protagonist. He was like, but, but she starts the game doing something really cold blooded and horrible. So why are people going to like her? And I thought, oh, yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't even stopped to consider that question because for me, I just, I, the moment Veronica Villanzi popped into my head as a writer, I just loved her. So when you play the game, first few playthroughs, there are a few little hints that maybe Malcolm was a bit of a brute. Maybe he was a bit violent. So you're kind of building up this, you've got this desire for Veronica's crime to turn out to be a good thing to have done. You want that to be the case. You, it's like when your friend does something wrong, you want to believe that they had a good reason to do it. So when you finally find out that, her husband, um, yeah, has links to the British fascist party of the 30s. It's kind of like a reward, isn't it? You kind of go, hey, he's a Nazi. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> you got him. <laughs> Fantastic. It sort of pays out that concern that you've had that maybe it, she's not a good person. Oh, no, it's fine. Everything's fine. He's a fascist. Over you go. <laughs> Let's get on with it. <laughs> you totally lose that, like, fear of what if I'm the bad guy? Nope, not at all. Exactly, exactly. And I think that, you know, that's really important to me on in another way, which is, that one of the core things that we wanted to do with the game was just make something that was joyous, that's just riotous and fun. And I like that as a kind of joyous twist on the on the, the kind of grim dark thing that you see. Yeah, I, I think I think the thing that stands out to me there is that when we were playing through it, every time we got a, a bad option, it was always almost more interesting than succeeding. Overboard did a really great job of always making sure that when I clicked an option and was like, oh, I didn't mean to click that. No matter what I hit, there was always something interesting on the other side of the choice I didn't mean to make. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, interactive fiction is like you set it up in advance and then you let the player explore it. So it's got to have boundaries, right? And everybody going into the game knows that there's a boundary. There's a point beyond which you just can't do. Like you can't set fire to the ship in Overboard. You can't blow it up. Fair enough. That's okay. So when there's an option like, well, there's this guy who sort of maybe knows something about me. So perhaps I could just kill him. Now, can I just kill him? Then you put that option in. People sort of expect to click the kill the steward button and have the game go, no, 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 no. Come on, you can't do that. Come on, that's that's out, that's beyond the pale. That's too far. And so when the game goes, okay, you've just done it. And you go, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> that experience of thinking you know where the boundary is and finding out that the boundary is actually way over there, much further out, it has this effect of making the world feel five times bigger than it really is. Yeah, I mean, there's there's that uh, that image that's been doing the rounds recently from a GDC talk you gave with the yikes, what did I just do? Right, yeah. That, that <laughs> I think perfectly yeah. encapsulates that idea. Yeah, so this uh, this murder mystery game, Overboard, moves at a, at a lightning pace. Uh, with, even with so few characters, everything's moving, there's momentum, crazy things are happening. Uh, we here at Death of the Reader are no strangers to interactive murder mysteries that revolve around the clock, uh, having covered Jordan Mechner's The Last Express previously on the show. Um, how did you settle on the decision to create such a short fuse for the narrative bomb of the story? Oh, I love The Last Express. It's like my favorite. Oh my game. goodness, we need to oh, talk. Oh gosh, oh, we need to talk. Calm down, boys. Who's calm your favorite down. Character? <laughs> it's just the best. It's the best written video game ah! ever. It's Still the best written video game ever. And like very few people have played it and it's just ludicrously well written. And I completely I'm agree. constantly going back and stealing things from it. Like like breaking into people's cabins because they happen not to be there at just that moment in time. I'll, I'll just, just <laughs> leave the room for a bit, leave you two to it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there was a question attached. Oh yeah, it was about fuse time. We wanted the whole game to feel like falling 
off something, basically falling overboard, right? The whole game, what to feel like you start the game by you fall over the rail and you're just going, ah, splash. We didn't want there to be a point in the middle where you're like, well, it's going to hang out now because there doesn't seem to be anything for me to do. It has to keep that constant forward pressure. Well, John, oh it has goodness. been an absolute pleasure having you on Death of the Reader. It has been such a joy both playing through overboard and getting to pick your brain on it. So thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you, guys. It's been a really fun. It's been excellent chatting with you. You're listening to Death of the Reader. John Ingold there talking about Overboard. We will have links up on the podcast if you want to get yourself a copy, which we would thoroughly recommend. And of course, make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss the very extended chat we had with John up on the podcast later this week. We are discussing Dead Little Roosters by Rooster Teeth, and we'll be back with more of that in just a second. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here with your Murder Mystery World Tour. We are talking episodes one to six of Dead Little Roosters by Rooster Teeth, an interactive whodunit series that took place earlier this year, started in January, wrapped up around February. And earlier on the show, we were talking about how well done it was in improv and how it managed to balance self-referential and uh, very easily understandable external humor. Accessible humor, yeah, for sure. And uh, the thing I wanted to get into in this discussion of the mystery, because we have six days or six uh, steps of the riddle that have taken place Quite here. Quite a lot together. I loosely followed this when it was coming out, just so that I we could cover it later this year, because I knew this interactive segment was coming up. And essentially what happened was there were eight weeks of the show and each week there, were a, there was a questionnaire where you could submit your predictions for who was going to die, what they were going to be killed with, and also each week who you thought the main culprit who killed Nicodemus, the rich guy who owns the mansion was. And each week there were prizes for the first person to get their answer in. And then in the final week, the person who got the most right across the series, including guessing the final culprit, got a massive grand prize. And I thought it was really interesting uh, the way that if you look through this poem once you've read it, you absolutely get that Van Dyne feeling of the answer staring you in the face, but it's also written really well in that it doesn't give everything away too much. No, it's, I mean, it's written like a riddle, right? Like it's, yeah. a, it's a proper riddle writing, uh, which I think is really admirable. The The art of the riddle has has slipped out of the public consciousness. Uh, but but yeah, like we, we are given these 10 characters and these 10 riddles and we even get a death before the end of the very first episode. Um, and you're right. I feel like the the story itself and what the audience is being asked to do is very straightforward. It's not the same. Uh, we've joked a little bit about ARGs, alternate or augmented reality games in the past, but those are often very obtuse. They require you to do very specific things find very specific puzzles and often end up with you like going into the mountains to find treasure. Yeah, exactly. If you're unfamiliar, they're basically interactive games that have pieces of them that take place in the real world. Exactly. But this, these riddles uh, you can solve just by sitting at your computer and watching Rooster Teeth shows or looking up certain facts online. I know there, there's one mystery, at least, that I know I could solve from the next couple episodes based on my own knowledge, you know, sort of thing. But it's it's very it's a very straightforward kind of concept, which I like a lot. I think it's also very good uh, from the audience perspective how if you've watched, for example, 11 Little Roosters, uh, that at least for the very first death in this series, Barbara, um, that – it's not necessarily a reference to the previous 10 Little Roosters series, but the first one is very obvious to set up the sort of thing that you're yeah. looking for. And even if you've only watched the other... The gun gauntlet. <laughs> so yeah, silly. Even if you've only watched the other uh, Little Rooster series, uh, that first clue is a great launching pad for an audience member to realize, yeah. oh, this is what the game is. And now I know what to do with the rest of it. Like, even if you cannot solve the riddles for the life of you, the way that they use Barbara's death at the start, not only as a nod to previous series, not only as a nod to other shows in their in their company, but also just as the most basic example of what's happening on this list so that you have a, a, a tutorial that doesn't feel like a tutorial within the show is fantastic. Yeah, look, Barbara went out with a yang and that was what the show needed at the time. Yeah, I mean, look, she's she's very dramatic. Her death is very dramatic. I'm pretty sure she gives a speech that's like, I'm going to go and find the killer and I'm going to take him down. Immediately dies. Immediately dies to blow dart to the neck. It's great. The other thing that was really interesting to me was when we get to the third death, for example, Michael's. Uh, that was a clue that I thought was really well done because it 
uh, death by platypus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a really silly death, but it also felt like a very good balance of paying attention to things inside and outside the series because it was a reference to something that Michael had done in another show, and also a reference to the list of weapons that we had. Well, the, the platypus clue specifically was foreshadowed by uh, Eric's boss. Is that Jordan? Is it? Is mm. that yeah? Who talks about how he he's like if he could be any animal, he'd be a platypus because he's crazy. Uh, and that is a reference to um, the, the the symbolic spur, I guess. I don't know the entire through line there, but basically him like talking about platypus and how dangerous they are is supposed to foreshadow the later death of, of Michael. And the other one I actually wanted to highlight was Blaine's death, which was bold of will but muddled <laughs> mind. The fifth was felled by double bind. The longest bit of the entire yeah, show. It was a great Ridiculous. example of a joke just paying off that required no external context. And... The thing that uh, I noticed as I was kind of picking these out is that the deaths that stood out to me were kind of staggered through this poem in a way that meant that no matter where you were in the audience, you were kind of drip fed a bit of satisfaction in how the poem played out one after the other. Now, Herds, before mm. we get into our final episode, we Uh-oh. do still have two deaths to solve oh, yeah, and we the final killer to pin. Yeah, sure. Uh, I know you have a suggestion I do. for the next two deaths, so I will well, leave that to you. The next two deaths. I, I'm pretty sure I know uh, the uh, the eighth death. The, the seventh death is Keyless Cooped in Trepidation, the seventh succumbed to Hand of Creation. So I'm not 100% sure about the seventh death, the, the method of death. Um, but it's uh, it's probably Issa. We've seen her quite a bit in the last couple episodes. Um, Hand of Creation, like the only thing of creation I'm familiar with is the creation star from Ruby, and that is not listed as one of the murder weapons. Uh, that said, the eighth death, uh, which is rivalry of siblings past, the eighth ended as first forecast. Now, I did some thinking. There's a bit in the show where they refer to uh, Alfredo and the detective as being brothers, but obviously it's, it's not going to be Alfredo for later reasons. But... Uh, as first forecast refers to the initial death of of Barbara, who plays a character named Yang in the in the Ruby series, which I have watched all eight volumes of. Don't hate. It seems to be the entire source of your knowledge here. It, it definitely is. Uh, but uh, Lindsay plays a character named Ruby, uh, and Yang and Ruby are both sisters. So I'm pretty sure that Yang is going to come back as a ghost with her gun gauntlet, uh, which was part of the first death, but wasn't actually used as a killing implement. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she's going to shoot her sister. Which is going to be fun. I'm excited for that. And uh, then the ninth, the killer, Justice it's, was fated. It's, it's Alfredo. Yeah. It's Alfredo. Not just because, like, I don't feel like he fits any other deaths, but, like, even further back, and this is why I'm, I'm sad I didn't get to actually participate in this as it came out, like, he gets so little screen time. Like, <laughs> he's one of those characters that is just kind of, he's in the group scenes, but he doesn't get any solo scenes because he's out murdering people. Like, come on. I, I, I did want to say the clue that sold me on Alfredo was the fact that uh, the mascot for, for Jordan's show that they, uh, for Face that Jam. Eric is, that for, oh, for Eric, Face Jam? Yeah, that Eric okay, produces sure. is called the Source Monkey. Of course. And I know for entirely unrelated reasons to the show that Alfredo's nickname is The Source. Uh-huh. So Great. Uh, <laughs> when we see the killer walking around in the Source Monkey outfit, I think that's meant to be. Is, is that a pasta sauce thing? Is that like. Source. I, you know I, I don't know. Is. I don't want to speculate. I'm worried about that territory. But yeah, I, I'm pretty sure uh, based on those those notes, uh, I'm not sure about how how Issa's going to die, but she's going to die in in part seven, or you know, as a seventh death, and then and then Lindsay's going to die the gun gauntlet. Yep. And then Alfredo is the killer, which yep. means that Eric gets away, which is Obviously. perfect because he's he gets the cathartic like I actually survived and I get all the money and I can solve all of my problems. Look, Here's I don't the thing. have a better. If option. we have gotten any of this wrong, I want to be clear: we are giving a point to Sean Britton. I mean, I don't even know who this what killed the seventh person, so we're already lost the point. Thanks, Flex. No, I mean th- that's that's here. what we have to do. We have to decide now. <laughs> all right, hand of creation then. Oh, is this pencil? Pencil because she, she writes. Because she writes. She ri- she rides because she's the ride of the show. There head of creation. Go. There you there go. There you go. He's his pencil. She's gonna fall. She's gonna All get right. joked. There you it. go. That's our solutions here on Death of the Reader. Thank you for joining us here in our first episode discussing Dead Little Roosters by Rooster Teeth, directed by Josh Flanagan and Fiona Nova. <sighs>
Exhausting. We are going to uh, join you next week with the last two episodes of the show. I hope you get the time to check it out. It is on a subscription service, but there is a week-long free trial. It's true. If you wanted to try that out. You just binge it over a weekend. Yeah, and I mean, I, I would thoroughly recommend that you do check this show out because even if it is not your speed, even if you are a more traditional murder mystery writer, even if you are too old for a lot of the very young leaning humor in this show, I think that it is an excellent case study in where the murder mystery field has led in the modern day because I think this is probably the largest audience thing we have covered on this entire show. It's an excellent little snapshot of murder mystery in the public conscience, I think. Sean all sides of the story. Well, best of luck to Sean Britton in unintentionally besting us. Look, we here we go. That's a good point. Next week on Death of the Reader, you're listening to 2SER 107.3.